Father, I pray, God, that you would use this message right here and right now to, in fact, make more of a reality what we sang about, that the world means nothing to us. And I pray, God, that you, Holy Spirit, would use the words to break bondages in people's lives, especially around the area of fear and anxiety and worry. Lord, uh, that is your job, not mine. And so I'm not going to try to, I'll open my mouth, but I'm not going to try to make that happen. You are the one who sets captives free, set us free, completely free, to walk in total fearless freedom. This morning in Jesus' name, amen. 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 We've been talking about um, the kingdom, the dome in which God is king. It's, it's, it's what this is all about. It's not really about church. It's not about good deed doers. It's, not, it's about being trained, discipled, uh, after the model of Jesus Christ, to learn how to live inside the dome in which God is king, God, God's sphere of influence. In this world, which is so conflicted, so many struggles, so much bloodshed, so much anger, animosity, fear, all of those things, in, in that world, there is something else going on. Nations rise and fall. But if you look closely with the right, right set of eyes, you'll see there is, as history moves forward, this other thing, this very different-looking thing. It's called the kingdom of God. It's always been small. The majority of people uh, don't want to align with it. Uh, but it's there. and It's a kingdom of people who are learning how to look like Jesus individually and as a community. It's, it's a, a, a community of people who are learning how to replicate Calvary. It's a community of people who don't think according to the world's common sense. They, their hope is not in power over. Their trust is in power under, and they live to that end. So what we're doing is talking about what is that dome in which God is king? What does it look like? And to develop a... a the right set of eyes to see it. And so we've talked about kingdom-centeredness, kingdom single mindedness and a number of other things. This morning I want to talk about kingdom courage or kingdom fearlessness because this also is an aspect of the kingdom. It's a topic that I think is especially important right now because we live in a, a real fearful world, a real fearful environment. Uh, especially here in America. Uh, I read one report that said that the level of of general anxiety among average Americans is, high, is almost to the level it was. It hasn't been this high uh, since uh, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. There's just this kind of pervasive anxiety, not just about uh, national fear, but certainly including that. It didn't help when, you know, y y we watch these debates, uh, which are thankfully over, uh, but uh, the, the two candidates were going, you know, against each other, and they both did a pretty good job of arguing that if the other guy gets elected, we're in deep trouble. <laughs> Which, to the thinking person, you walk away and, and, and you think, well, whoever gets elected, we're in deep trouble. Uh, that, that installs fear in people. Uh, I read an article in U.S. Uh, News and World Report that said that 49% of all Americans uh, are afraid of, are, have, have a fear of a cyber attack. And what's really interesting about that is that only about 30% of Americans know what a cyber attack is. <laughs> but we're afraid of it. <laughs> Whatever it is, those cyborgs are going to get us. Uh, it's just a general state of fear. 75% of Americans say that uh, to some degree they live day by day in, in the fear of a terrorist attack. And it doesn't help that every once in a while you hear this announcement or read it in the newspaper uh, that w w the president has now upped the alert level to an orange level, a level four alert. So take extra precautions. <laughs> uh, and I can understand why they would tell, you know, security people that and the police force and the military. But why do they tell us civilians? How, how are we supposed to take extra precautions? What does that even mean? Uh, you know, wonder or worry about anybody that looks suspicious? You know, like, <laughs> I got neighbors that look suspicious every day. I mean, it's like, I, I, that's not... All it means is that your chances of dying are greater today than usual, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> and so it ups your anxiety level. People live in fear. There's a kind of primordial anxiety and angst that characterizes a, a, a lot of people. And it's not just about 
national worries. It's about crime. America is the third safest country on the planet, but Americans live in more fear than any other country on the planet. And that's why we spend so much on locks and security devices and guns, uh, because we, we just have the sense that crime is always just around the corner. And in some parts of the neighborhood, it certainly is. But part of it is that we're bombarded by a media, which, what do they report? Uh, it's never, it's never. Uh, our leading news today, what a great day we've had. <laughs> the sun was shining and hardly any crime, and people were, seemed to be nicer than usual today. No one leads off with that story. It doesn't sell. What sells is we had four murders and three kidnappings and the war is going terrible and, you know, this, that, and the other kind of catastrophe. So what happens is that it's kind of engraved in our psyche that the apocalypse is just around the corner. And even if it was, that shouldn't worry us, but it tends to make us worried. We live in kind of a fearful uh, state of being and many other concerns as well. To live, listen to this. To live consistent with the kingdom, the dome in which God is king, is not to be unconcerned about ordinary things. You're not so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. But it is to live completely without fear. To live completely without fear. Can you envision yourself living totally free from fear of anything, of anything? Let's do a quick little Bible study of what uh, the Bible says about fear. Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 said, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. And pretty much, see, if, if you learn how not to worry about your life, you're not going to be worried about very much because that kind of covers everything. Don't worry about your life. For example, what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. Life, real life, not just biological life. That's relatively unimportant. But abundant life, kingdom life, is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. The Gentiles, and see, he's talking to Jews, and so by Gentiles he means the people who don't know anything about God. They live, they strive for all these things. That's, that's pretty much all they think about. They're biological beings who worry about biological issues. But see, you know that your heavenly Father knows that you need these things, so trust him for it. But what you should every moment be striving for, Jesus says, is, is the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Strive first. Seek first. Which means seek at every moment the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. You trust God and seek the kingdom first. It is an amazing teaching when we consider the fact that he's talking to people who are under political oppression. They're under Roman rule. It's an amazing teaching when you consider that almost everybody that he's talking to right now would be by our standards in absolute poverty. And yet Jesus is saying, don't worry. Don't, don't worry about your life. Just seek first the kingdom of God. He's recommending almost a shocking level of carefreeness. Amazing carefreeness to people who are living hand to mouth. Have a radical trust in God, and therefore do not worry. Don't fear these things. Have one thing on your mind, and that is living each moment as close to the kingdom as you can be, where God's love defines you and God loves flow, flows through you. Romans chapter 8, Paul said, We did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into, the, into fear, but you've received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit, that we are the children of God. Fear manifests a spirit of slavery. To the extent that you're fearful, to the extent that you're living in fear, you are enslaved. Paul contrasts the spirit of slavery with the spirit of adoption. When you have the spirit of adoption, you know that you're adopted by your heavenly father. And that's why you can call him Abba. He's your daddy. And so you know that the one who runs the universe is your daddy. You're his little kid. And Paul is saying that that can give us, should give us such a sense of security, whatever is happening in the world and whatever is happening to us, we can have such a profound sense of security that we're no longer slaves to fear. We're no longer scrambling on our own because we have this profound childlike trust in Abba, Father. 
2 Timothy, Paul says, God didn't give us a spirit of cowardice. It's not a nail-biting spirit. It's not an anxious spirit. It's not a self-protective spirit, a cowardly spirit, but rather he gave us a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. A spirit that fears nothing. And you need to know that if you are surrendered, genuinely surrendered in your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that spirit resides within you. You may not experience it very much because there's things that are clogging it, and we'll talk about that, that shortly, but that spirit is within you. You have the spirit to be courageous, adventuresome, not cowardly. Hebrews chapter 2. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, Jesus himself shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and thereby free those, look at that, free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. We once again get the teaching that fear is slavery. The most common fear, and really it is a substratum of all other fears, is the fear of death, the ending of your own life. Uh, it permeates all other fears, which are, are experienced as various forms of death. But when we understand that the power, the one who holds the power of death has been defeated, then we are in a position to be completely free from the devil, completely free from the fear of the devil, completely free from the fear of death, and therefore completely free from the fear of anything, including hard circumstances. Uh, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 3, even if you suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Abba, Father is on the throne, and his promise to you is that he'll use your suffering for good. So you can still consider yourself blessed even when you're suffering, even when you suffer because you've done good things. So he says, don't fear. Don't fear what they fear. The they are the pagans, the people who don't know God, uh, who, who don't live in the kingdom. Of course they fear um, many things. Suffering, they fear death, they fear loss, fear many things, but don't fear what they fear. And therefore, don't be intimidated by anything. In 1 John chapter 4, he says very plainly, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. And Paul says, as we've seen many times in Ephesians chapter 5, Be imitators of God. Live in love as Christ loved us and gave his life for us. We're to live in that love, which means we're to breathe that love, think that love have our heart beat, beating that love. And insofar as we do that, put these two passages together here, we live without fear. Fear has no place where you're living in love. And yet many, many people live in fear. Let me uh, give you a little story about fear. I think this is what all fear looks like. When I was a kid, I lived in Lansing, Michigan, from the ages of three to seven. And... Um, uh, we had a newly blended family that was rather large and quite conflicted. And uh, so my brother and I, our bedroom was the attic. They had to make the attic into our bedroom. So, you know, it was one of those little bedrooms which are tiny and, and the, the, the ceiling goes like this, you know, and you can't stand up too quickly or you bump your head, that kind of thing. And uh, it, was a, it was a good room for my brother and I, except when there were thunderstorms. It was uh, something about that attic turned nightmarish when there were thunderstorms. You're right at the top of the house, close to the, you know, the lightning. And uh, it, the room turned into a den of monsters whenever there was a thunderstorm. Uh, we would hide underneath our blankets and uh, peep out. And, and when the light would flash into the room, we'd always see monsters. And we, my brother and I would tell each other what monsters we're seeing. And I always saw them under his bed, and he saw them under my bed. And uh, we talk ourselves into a state of terror. <laughs> it was... And I'd always want to run down and get mom and dad to chase away the monsters, but my brother was always too proud. He was two years older than me, and he'd always, he was afraid to admit that he believed in monsters uh, to anyone other than me. Uh, now, there's one particular thunderstorm. It was the worst I, I remember, where oh, the, it was so loud. I mean, the, 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 the thunder would rock like the house. It would shake, and, and, and the lightning was just coming in uh, so frequently. And there's a... a an extraordinarily high number of monster sightings this particular night. <laughs> and we were just terrified as we're like, do you see anything, Chris? Do you see anything, Greg? And, and uh, hiding under the covers. Now, the, the trouble is we both had to go to the bathroom very, very bad. 
And, uh, but we weren't going to get out of our covers to go. Eventually, the storm subsided a little bit. The thunder grew a little bit less uh, loud and the lightning a little more infrequent. So my brother, being the older and the more courageous of, of the two, he decided he was going to make a run for it. My job was to, to keep a lookout and tell him if I had any monster sightings. So uh, he runs out and goes to the bathroom. It's just outside, down the hall, a little ways from our attic. And um, uh, you know, everything's going well, except that I hear him scream to me at one point, Greg! There's a monster trying to get out of the toilet. <laughs> and he was serious. And what he was referring to there was, uh, he says, the water's acting funny. Because if, if you get your water pressure from a water tower, sometimes during storms, have you ever had this happen? The, the toilet bowl kind of goes up and down. You ever see the water do that? And so he's there, you know, relieving himself. And there's this water going up and down. And he's thinking there's a monster trying to push its way out. <laughs> So I say, Chris, forget about it. Just you know, stop what you're doing. Come and come and you're back to bed. It's going to grab you, <laughs> which would be painful. And um, but he says, I can't stop. I can't stop. <laughs> so <if> I, <laughs> you guys know what we're talking about. That's an impossibility. <laughs> so he finally finishes his deed and flushes the monster back down the toilet and starts running back to the bedroom. And just as he gets at the corner of the bedroom, right at the door, there was this incredibly loud thunderclap. And the lightning, it must have been very close because the lightning was simultaneously with the sound. The light comes into the room just as he's running in, and I see a little green monster nipping at his heels. <laughs> I'm telling you, I, maybe the room was demon-possessed. I don't know. But, but I saw something. So I holler out, Chris, <laughs> it's biting your feet. And Chris proceeded, he was always very athletic, but we can't document this, but, but he set a world record in long jumping. Uh, that, that moment, boom, he was there. From one end of the room to the other, I don't know how he did it, but he flew into the air, <laughs> landed in the bed, wrapped himself up in covers. After that, I wasn't going to get out uh, to... Uh, I, 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 for the rest of the night, I don't care what happened, and so I proceeded to wet the bed. But um, now, see, we know that the monster wasn't real, and we know that, that it, you know, it's a projection of our terrified psyche. And we also know that if there were monsters, security blankets wouldn't be much good. I always wondered about that. How come monsters can't get through the blankets? Um, you know, but they never could, so, you know, ours is not the reason why. Ours is but to hide or die. So we, we would uh, hide there. But I'm not sure, really that we grow up all that much. Because it seems to me that we still run from monsters that are the creations of our own fears and hide under security blankets that we know don't really uh, provide any security, but they make us feel a little bit better, but the fear goes on. Uh, some are running from a monster of, of this national fear or personal injury, so they hide behind various blankets. But there's a multitude of other things that we run from. For example, some run from a monster of rejection. There you go. That, that's almost exactly what the monster that was chasing my brother looked like. A monster of, of, of uh, rejection. They're afraid of being alone in life. And they're always running from it. They have an anxiety that people are going to leave them, people are going to hurt them, people are going to abandon them. And so they hide behind a blanket of strategies to try to keep people liking them. Whatever it is that they think people want, they try to give. You want funny, I'll give you funny. You want religious, I'll give you religious or, or whatever. Some people hide behind a blanket of, of control. They feel like they need to control people because if you don't control people and manipulate them, they're surely going to leave. They live their life running to some degree from a monster of rejection and hiding under a security blanket of strategies to hide from that monster. Some people hide from a monster of poverty uh, and, and, and their blanket is uh, you know, always trying to acquire more. Some people hide from a monster of aging and death. They hide, their blanket is, is a, a system of strategies to look as young as possible and to talk as young as possible and to act as young as possible. You go to your 25th year reunion, some of you have done that, and you'll find a certain number of people, especially the ones who were really popular in high school, the cheerleaders and the jocks, they're still doing their shtick. They're, you know, oh, you know, they're, they're still waving their hair the cutesy way they did it and talking their little flirty way that they used to do it and dressing like they did back then, but, but it doesn't work anymore. But they don't know that. See, they're afraid. They're afraid. They're, they're trying to stay off this monster, so they're hiding. Some fear a monster of failure and therefore hide behind a blanket of perfectionism or overachievement or risk-free living. 
And there's many other monsters we hide from, a monster of shame or a monster of emptiness. Some run from a monster of ever being wrong. They have to always be right. Some run from a monster of past experience. Something happened in the past and they're still terrified of it. The nature of the monster determines the nature of the blanket that we hide from. But what they all have in common is that the monster is simply the projection of our terror, and the blanket isn't, is, is supposed to give us security, but really doesn't. The, the blanket belief that we hide behind is really something like this. The belief is that if only I can hang on to something, then I'll be safe. Then I'll have life. Then, then I won't lose something that is life to me. If only I can hang on to people, if I can keep people around me, keep them thinking I'm, I'm, I'm funny or keep them thinking that I'm, I'm, I'm together or keep them thinking that I'm holy or whatever, then, then, I'll, then I won't be alone. If only I can keep the money rolling in, then I'll never be out on the streets. If only I can stay looking young and sexy, then men or women will still find me attractive. If only I can keep from failing, uh, then I'll be safe. Then I'll be secure. Then I'll have life. But see, that hiding under the blanket is never the way we're supposed to live, and it does us great harm. It sucks kingdom life out of us. Now, there is a kind of fear that is not harmful, and, and th that is godly, that, that is natural. God gave us a device, it's called the amygdala, which when we're in a threatening situation, we naturally take extra precaution. If you're walking along and you see a snake that has a, a tail that's rattling, you want to take extra precaution. That's a normal good thing. There's a kind of a fear there, like, oh, this could bite me and then I'd be in trouble. Uh, if, if you're in a situation where, like we had this last week, a gang fight broke out, bro, uh, broke out on our street. Uh, this is, it's normal to you have your heart go a little faster and lock the door. This isn't the time to decide to go out and rake your leaves. Uh, you know, you, 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 there's, a, uh, there's a, a, a warning that says, okay, take extra precaution. You call 911, lock your doors, and, and wait till it's over. And so in a multitude of situations, there's a healthy kind of natural inbuilt God thing that says, warning, this could be dangerous. We have that on an ethical level, too. When you're in situations that you know might compromise you, there's, there's, there ought to be a warning device, like Joseph had with Potiphar's wife, where he hightails it and runs away. Get out of there. This isn't going to be a good thing. But that's not the, the kind of fear that I'm talking about, the kind of fear that destroys us. Here's the difference. Healthy fear is always occasional. There's an occasion that evokes it, and it's always temporary. Unhealthy fear is something that we live in, it, it, in part, defines us. Healthy fear happens to us on occasion, and it's temporary because there's something we can do to get out of it. Unhealthy fear is inside of us. It always characterizes us to some degree. We can ignore it for some time, but it's always there waiting to be activated. Unhealthy fear is the kind of fear that comes when you're running from a monster and you're trying to hide under a blanket as a strategy for getting life. And to the degree that we live in that... To the degree that we're running from a monster, it destroys us. While our bodies are built to handle occasional healthy fear, they're not built to handle pervasive anxiety and worry. It wears us out. Studies have shown that people who live with this ongoing pervasive anxiety have a much higher frequency of diseases, heart disease, liver disease, and, and, and other things. And there's other physical complications as well. But even more profound is the damage it does to us emotionally, psychologically, and especially spiritually. It destroys us. That's why Paul says that it's a spirit of bondage. Fear is a spirit of bondage. It is bondage to Satan. It sucks life out of us. It's a prison we were never meant to live in. It is impossible to live abundant life to the degree that you're living in fear. It's utterly impossible to live in the joy and the peace and the love of the kingdom, the dome in which God is king, to the extent that you're living in anxiety and fear. God never intended us to live in this kind of fear. He rather intends us to live in abundant life. And one of the primary reasons why Jesus uh, freed us from the enemy is to free us from that, 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 that spirit of fear. God has not given to us a spirit of cowardice, Paul says once again, but of power, love, and self-discipline. He's given us a spirit of adoption by which we cry, Abba, Father. He's given us, saints of God, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit ain't no coward. 
The Holy Spirit is not timid. The Holy Spirit is not fearful. The Holy Spirit does not run from monsters. The Holy Spirit slays monsters, all right? And we have that spirit within us. God's goal for us kingdom people is to have this kind of foolish-looking, almost reckless lifestyle, this carefreeness, this joy that permeates our life, this, this sense of adventure, this sense of abandon, uh, this willingness to take risks, we are to be anything but cowards who are hiding underneath blankets. Now, that spirit is within us. But what keeps us from experiencing that? Another way of asking that is to ask this question. How does the devil kill, steal, and destroy the abundant life that Jesus came to give us? And here's how it works. Like everything else, listen to this, like everything else in our life that is sub-kingdom, this area is based on a lie. Because all areas of our life that are sub-kingdom are based on lies. Here, here's, here's the demonic deception. The lie is that you need X as the source of life. X is anything other than Christ. You need X. You need your looks. You need your, your youthfulness. You need, you need people around you as a source of life. If you believe that, you will invariably create and fear a monster. You create it, and you fear it, and you run from it, and the monster is not getting or losing what you think is life to you. As a result of that, you hide under a blanket, and the blanket is your strategy for getting or keeping X. And when you do that to the degree that you do that, you squelch abundant life, because abundant life is the result, the direct result, of having Christ alone as your source of life. Locate any fear and you'll find a need belief fueling that fear and a hiding belief as a strategy to keep you from what you fear. For example, the monster of rejection. Let's look at that. The monster of rejection, if that is your fear, you look at it, you'll see that it's based on a lie. The lie is that your value and worth is determined by other people. If others don't accept you, on some level, maybe not consciously, but on some level, you don't think you're acceptable. If others don't uh, validate you, you don't think you're valid. If others don't love you, you don't think you're lovable. You don't feel lovable. And so the blanket you hide behind, as I said earlier, is a system, a strategy to keep people validating you, recognizing you, affirming you, hanging around you, loving you. But what you got to know is that this is a lie, isn't it? It's a lie. It's nice to be recognized and accepted and validated by people. But you don't need this as a source of life. God intends us to be living in community. That's very important. But he never intends us to have other people as a source of life, a source of our validation, a source of our self-worth. The truth which sets us free is that you're recognized by your creator, and that's recognition enough. You're validated by your creator, and no amount of other validation could ever add to that. You're loved by your creator, and that is life itself. It's nice if people agree with God about that, and they should, but if they don't, so what? It's nice to have it, but you don't need it as a source of life. Two other things you need to know about monsters that we run from. Your fear of rejection is causing you more pain than the rejection you fear. That's why it's bondage to Satan. We pay more by fearing having to pay than we actually pay when that which we fear happens to us. The pain of, you might put it like this, the pain of suffocating under the blanket that you're hiding from the monster, that you're using to hide from the monster, is worse than the bite of the monster ever could be. That's why it's a deception. The second thing is that your fear actually increases the likelihood of the rejection that you fear. And this applies to all monsters we run from. The kingdom paradox is this. Now listen to this. The more you cling to something, the more likely it is that you're going to lose it. The less you cling to it, the more likely it is that you're going to get it. This is why Jesus said in Matthew 25, it's a, it, it doesn't make sense according to the world because all they know is clinging. But kingdom people need to know this principle. To those who have, more will be given, and they, they will have uh, an abundance, even though they don't need it. From those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken. He's talking about the guy who hoarded the one, the one talent that his boss had given him. He was afraid, so he clung to it, and so it was taken from him. Those people who took risks, they acquired more. 
God's mode of living is risk-free living. And when you don't fear losing it, you're more, you're more inclined to get it. People who live in the fear of rejection tend to make themselves the kind of people that others reject. They're, they're, they're too needy. They're too clingy. They're, you know, and so people tend to push them away. People who don't need other people as a source of life. You want people, you love people, but you don't need them as a source of life. They tend to have a kind of life that is attractive to other people. So precisely because they don't need it, they get it. The other folks, precisely because they need it, they tend not to get it. Fear is, to a large degree, this isn't a formula, but it's a principle. It is, to a large degree, a self-fulfilling prophecy. It goes counter the current of life. The way to be free from monsters is to wake up to the lie that's creating the monster and that we're running from. It's to grow up in Christ and realize there isn't any monster other than the one that you're creating by running from the supposed monster. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free, Jesus said. When you know the truth, it sets you free from the fear of monsters. It's nice to have people accept you and love you and validate you, but what if they don't? So what? Your life is found in Jesus Christ. Stop running from the monster because there isn't any monster other than the one that you're creating by running from it. It's nice to have financial security. That's wonderful. But what if you don't? What if you So what? Don't worry about that. Don't fear that. God is your Abba Father. He'll give you what you need. That's why Jesus said, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about your life. Your father knows you have need of these things. Now, immediately, our, our culturally conditioned practical machine kicks in. Well, if I don't do this, that, and the other thing, da, 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 then I won't have any money. Now, he's not saying sit on your butt and watch soap operas and expect God to take care of you. No, you do due diligence. You're, you know, you're concerned about these things, but you don't worry about them. There shouldn't be a fear that is there. Let it go. Stop running from monsters because there are no monsters other than the ones that you're created by running from them. It's nice to look as youthful as possible and as attractive as possible and as healthy as possible. Wonderful. But so what? So, so what if you don't? So what if you age? Eh. Jesus said this, who by worrying about it, by fearing it, can add one hour to their life? Let it go. I got a news flash for you. You're going to die. Another news flash. On the way, you're going to decay. <laughs> so here's the news flash. The wrinkles are going to come, most likely, uh, sooner or later. Fine, you know, stay them off as much as you can, but they're going to come. And you're probably, most of us, are going to get a little pudgy, you know, in certain areas. And, uh, you know, you, the body's going to wear down. Roll with it. Don't worry about that. You got a, you got a glorified body coming. It will come sooner. You're, you're going to live forever. Don't cling to this life like that. Let it go. Move on with life. Don't run from the monster because there isn't any monster other than the one that you're creating by running from it. It's nice to have a pain-free and mistake-free past where there is no shame. But what if you didn't? What if you didn't? Let it go. Let it go. Don't let the past pollute the present. The present is what is real, and the present is Jesus Christ. Forgive wrongs that were done to you, and forgive wrongs. Listen, someone needs to hear this. Forgive the wrong that you did. Forgive it. Let it go. Get on with life. Uh, uh, stop running from a monster, because there isn't any monster other than the one that you're running from. And it's nice to always be successful and to never fail, but you know what? You're probably going to fail sooner or later. Let it go. Uh, when you fail, whether it's in a business or whatever, um, uh, just so what? So what? Pick yourself up, you know, dust your pants off, and get back in the game. Don't run from a monster of failure because there isn't for the believer any monster to run from other than the one that you're creating by running from it. And it's nice if terrorists don't attack us, isn't it? That's a good day. That's a good day. Uh, you know, and, and take whatever precautions we can take. That, that's normal. But you know what? We're going to die anyways. And so be concerned about that, but don't worry about it. Don't, don't fear that. Don't let it put anxiety in your heart. That's actually why they're called terrorists, because they're going to do it. They want to install terror in you. Be above that. Uh, you get bombed, you get bombed. You know, you go to heaven a little earlier than you thought. Okay, that's not the end of the world. Now, some people, here's a major monster, especially in religious circles. Yeah, but what about civilization? What about the world? What about democracy in America? You know, we need to be worried about this. You know, do what you can, fine. 
But at some point, you're, you're going to have to let God uh, be God and, and let God run the universe and stop. Here's a, here's a tip that's worth the price of admission this morning. Don't take responsibility to manage the flow of history. All right? Uh, uh, it, it's just not a good job description for a human being. You'll be living, that's a terrible monster to run from, the monster of world problems. And you're supposed to fix the world problems. You know what? Sh- short of Jesus Christ, there's no fix in the world problems. You can work around them more or less, but, but, but look it. The world's not going to end before God decides it's supposed to end, all right? And when it ends, he's going to set up a new heavens and a new earth, and there won't be any terrorists there. So think about that and relax. Chill a little bit. Let it go. Get the peace that passes understanding. The answer to the bondage, the slavery of fear, is the same as the answer to everything. And that is what Paul says when he says, live in love as Christ loved us and gave his life for us. Because perfect love, John says, casts out all fear. When I make this, here's freedom. Uh, Life starts to happen when you let go of all fear. When... Living in love, the love that I have because of Calvary, when I live in that moment by moment, and my one job is to reflect that, when that becomes more important than my life itself, nothing compares to this. I got one job right now. Receive it and shine it. Receive it and shine it. When nothing is even a close second to that, you have no fear. You have no fear. Kill me? All right. All right. Uh, you know, I'd rather you didn't, but I, 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 I'm not going to fear that. Financial loss? Well, to live in that kind of love, you see, is to have already lost your life. Life as it's defined in this world, because life as it's defined in this world is me hanging on to self. To the degree that you're hanging on to self, you're going to fear losing self and fear losing all that is dear to you. Live in love as Christ loved us and gave his life for us. And you'll find that fear, those monsters, turn around and look at the monster and you'll see, you know what, there ain't no monster. The only monster was the one that you were creating by running from a monster. He, call, he, he died and called us to live in total, total freedom. I want to end in prayer and then, uh, and as I do so, I'd like to ask the prayer team to come up here. And uh, if you would like to receive prayer for anything, and maybe it's a bondage, a bondage of fear, anxiety. Don't walk out with that anxiety. Or if you just want to stay for a little bit and and just receive this, just let this message soak in, then do that. If you're here this morning and you've never joined the kingdom by surrendering your life to Jesus Christ, and you've counted the costs and you've decided you want to do that, because that's where life is found, I encourage you to come forward and up here to my right and your left, there'll be a person who will explain to you how easy it is to get started on this kingdom walk. Can we stand and, and just close in prayer? Father, I thank you for total freedom. I thank you for total freedom. Freedom from all fear. Freedom from the slavery of the enemy. Uh, Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, right now, would you... I, I, Lord, this is such a waste of time if this is just words. Lord, make, bring the reality of what, uh, of what your word says into our hearts and into our lives right now. Holy Spirit, help us all right now, individually and together, receive the freedom from fear. Receive the freedom from fear. Lord, help us right now to be unconditionally open to receiving the spirit of adoption, whereby we know you as Abba Father. Help us, Lord God, to receive the spirit of faith right now, which which causes us to trust in you for all things in a childlike, innocent kind of way. Father, help us right now to let go of our life, to die right now, and then to experience the real life, the abundant life, the courageous life, the adventuresome life that you called for us to have. Holy Spirit, be working on us. And as we go out of here, I pray, Lord God, that you'd make us shine with that adventuresome, carefree, dancing spirit uh, that we're still somewhat concerned about things in the world, but we never fear them, Lord. Let it be real. Let it be real. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said one more time. Amen. Amen. Go out fearlessly.